Act and Title I made by the Every Student Succeeds Act and give you a couple other updates along the way. My name is Barbara Duffield. I am the Director of Policy and Programs for NACI and I am joined with Patricia Julianell, NACI's Director of State Projects and Legal Affairs. Before we get going, just a couple pieces of housekeeping. First of all, you have this PowerPoint um, for your use uh, in the materials folder. If you look at the materials folder, you'll see you can download the PowerPoint, um, follow along, have it, uh, edit it for your for future trainings that you do, uh, whatever you'd like to do, you have it there. Also, in terms of questions and answers, if you, we have everyone muted for now, but if you have questions, please enter them in the chat box. Make sure you send them to all. Patricia will answer some questions as they arise, and then she will also sort questions that we can answer um, verbally uh, toward the end of the presentation. So just please do keep sending in your questions as they come up. And um, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Just an overview of what we'll look at this afternoon. We'll, we'll review the effective dates for the ESSA changes to McKinney-Vento and Title I. We'll take a look at the status of the federal guidance and, and what guidance really is and what it means. And then we'll review the major changes to the law in the following areas. We'll look at state coordinators and liaisons, uh, eligibility and identification, school of origin, school stability provisions. We'll look at immediate enrollment disputes, Title I and higher education. So that is what we uh, have on tap for our overview this afternoon. To start with the effective dates, um, the effective dates for this uh, reauthorization are um, a little interesting. They're not exactly rolled out in a, in a totally logical fashion, so it helps to go over them. There's also been a lot of confusion because some things have changed. So just by way of background, the Every Student Succeeds Act really is the vehicle for making the amendments to McKinney-Vento Title I and other programs of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. All of the McKinney-Vento amendments go into effect on October 1st, with the exception of the removal of awaiting foster care placement. That comes out of McKinney-Vento on December 10th. In most states, Dece December 10th, 2016. And for Arkansas, Delaware, and Nevada, it comes out in December 10th of 2017. Um, so McKinney-Vento, all of McKinney-Vento, October 1st, that's just three weeks away, and then a little bit longer for the changes around foster care. With respect to Title I, the Title I foster care provisions also go into effect on December 10th. So the removal of awaiting foster care from McKinney-Vento and the addition of the foster care protections for educational stability and access happen on the same day, December 10th. With respect to Title I and homelessness, those provisions go into effect for the 2017-2018 school year. So I think um, you know, part of the reason for the confusion is uh, the, the, the media and the education press have really honed in on 2017-18 as the date for ESSA, but in fact, um, parts of it go into effect sooner. So October 1st for McKinney-Vento um, and then December 10th for awaiting foster care and the Title I foster care provisions. In terms of the guidance, uh, the Department of Education does have the authority to issue what's called non-regulatory guidance. Non-regulatory is just what it means. It means it's not regulations. It, it is, um, does not have the force of law. Uh, what it does do is indicate the department's interpretation of the statute. So for McKinney-Vento and for some of the Title I provisions, the Department of Education did issue guidance uh, on, in July, July 27th. Uh, they also issued at the same time a fact sheet for educators and um, a press release. So that happened at the end of July. And then they also issued their non-regulatory guidance for foster care in June. So um, they have those materials out. We'll show you links on the next website where you can download all of that material. Uh, but again, the guidance is just what it says. It's guidance. It's not law. In fact, it, it cannot be interpreted to create new requirements. In terms of where you can find everything, we wanted to put this particular resource right up front because we know sometimes you have to leave the webinar early. Here is your NACI one-stop shop for S implementation. Uh, we've divided up the, our S implementation really into four kind of sub pages, but for the sake of the webinar, just to let you know some of the things that you can find, you can find the summaries of the bills, like just 
a bulleted list of what the provisions are. You can find timelines, links to the federal guidance that we that I just talked about. We have sample PowerPoints in different sizes. So depending on if you have two hours or one hour or less, um, various PowerPoints that you can take and adapt for your audience. There's a PowerPoint on students with disability in ESSA who are experiencing homelessness that Patricia did. And we just put one up, um, I believe it was last week, about the amendment in McKinney-Vento about liaisons being authorized to affirm under HUD homeless status. So that is new in there. We've got pop quizzes, scenarios. We have a, a couple fact sheets, uh, one on uh, considerations for de designating McKinney Mental Liaisons, a guide on transportation for foster youth and those local policies, other sample policies. So just there's a lot there. And we one of the what we're getting a lot of questions on every day is, you know, when are you guys going to update your frequently asked questions document? This is something that we did with the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. I think back in 2009, and it's nearly done. We will have it um, out uh, hopefully in two weeks. So I think we're now up to 145 most frequently asked questions, but just know that that's coming and uh, many other materials as well. Moving on now to our main topic du jour, we have the um, McKinney-Vento Act, again, it's been around for a long time, almost 30 years, um, was reauthorized, and um, as you know, it works very closely with Title I and the other federal education programs. In terms of how the funding works for McKinney-Vento, ESSA did increase the authorized funding level to state education agencies. Um, it is still woefully inadequate, but it did increase it. In fact, it got the largest percentage increase of all the federal education programs in that were reauthorized by ESSA. Uh, the money goes to states uh, based on the Title I formula, and then states are required to award competitive subgrants to school districts based on the need in the school district and also the quality of the proposal. With these next slides, as we go over the major changes in the law, you'll notice that um, there's some is red and some is blue. It has nothing to do with the election. It's not about red or blue or any of that. Um, the blue text is current law. Those are things that remain the same. And then the uh, red or maroon text is uh, represents changes, things that were added by ESSA. So every, and you'll notice as we go through these that there's a lot that for ma many of these you'll say, well, that doesn't seem new to me. That's already happening. Again, at the ESSA amendments were really based on best practice. So uh, the ease or difficulty with which school districts implement this new legislation, much of it will be depending on sort of where they were prior to in terms of their practice with McKinney-Vento. Every state, again, required to designate a state coordinator. The addition is that the state coordinator must now be able to sufficiently carry out their duties. So acknowledging that's a big job and that they really need to be have, have the time and the ability to carry out those duties. There are some um, additions to those duties. State coordinators now explicitly in the law must conduct monitoring of school districts to ensure compliance. They're required to post on the State Education Agency website and annually update a list of the school district liaison's contact information um, and duties and also data on student homelessness. And if you've ever um, been working to try to transfer a student to a different school district or find somebody, you know that it can potentially be a challenge if you have to dig and dig on the SEA website and you can't even find the homeless education page, let alone the liaison contact information. So starting October 1st, that will be a new responsibility. And also a new, um, again, explicit responsibility for the state coordinator to respond to inquiries from homeless parents and unaccompanied youth to make sure that they have the full protections of the law. This, I think, was obviously an, an expectation, but now it's um, spelled out explicitly in the legislation. Moving on to the role of local liaisons, again, a long-time requirement for every school district to designate a McKinney-Vento liaison. The addition here is now that that liaison must be able to carry out his or her duties. Uh, so there, again, acknowledgement that this is a job that, depending on the school district, um, it may not be able to be done if it's one of uh, seven hats a person wears. So the next question becomes, well, what does that mean to be able to carry out his or her duties? Here we would really refer you to the federal guidance. They did a really nice job. They have a full page on how school districts can um, make sure that the person at the state and, SC and local level are able to carry out their duties, and also would refer you to the two-pager that we put on our website with some considerations on how LEA administrators can make sure that the McKinney Mental Liaison is able to carry out her duties, his or her duties, um, and knowing that this will be one of the things that states will be required to monitor as well. 
So that's one of, I think, one of the potentially the farthest reaching amendments in ESSA for McKinney Vento. With respect to those liaison duties, there are some changes and some additions. And it's going to continue the, the responsibility to make sure that disputes are resolved, that acts, assistance to um, transportation is provided. One of the pieces that's new is to ensure that unaccompanied youth are enrolled in school and receive credit for full or partial schoolwork that they completed satisfactorily at a prior school. And we know that when youth move around a lot, they fall behind in credits. They fall behind in credits, they're less likely to graduate, less of an incentive to stay in school. So making sure that if they did work satisfactorily, that they do get credit for it. Um, this is something that liaisons will be implementing, but the state has an important role as well. And Patricia will go over um, in her section a little bit more about what the state requirement is, but essentially liaisons are carrying out that new policy. Additional McKinney-Vento liaison responsibilities, again, some of this are the same, enroll and have opportunity to succeed in the school. In terms of the identification provisions, um, liaisons have a longstanding requirement to make sure um, that McKinney-Vento students are identified by school personnel through outreach and coordination with their other entities and agencies. So outreach is the addition there, so it's even more proactive. Uh, and then we have some good guidance, again, from the Department of Education that really this identification needs to be part of all of the school district's needs assessments and school improvement plans. And um, if you look, if you actually look at the strike through of the reauthorization, sort of which words were added and which were deleted, I think there are at least five different amendments um, to McKinney-Vento that add in identification. So again, there's a longstanding acknowledgement that um, homeless students are um, have been under identified for a number of different reasons and this reauthorization aims to correct that. Related to that, um, public notice of McKinney-Vento rights uh, must be disseminated in locations frequented by parents, guardians, unaccompanied youth in a manner and form understand understandable to them. So uh, depending on what your community looks like, that could mean different things. Um, our partners at the National Center for Homeless Education, um, uh, which is the U.S. Department of Ed Technical Assistance Clearinghouse, they have some materials uh, in different languages. Um, some state education agencies have materials in different languages. So uh, those notices need to be, uh, again, understandable, and they need to be in places where people can actually see them. Moving on to some additional responsibilities, um, this next piece here is extremely important that liaisons ensure that school personnel providing McKinney mental services receive professional development and other support. So we have, we, we didn't go over it in this PowerPoint, but the state actually has a new responsibility to provide professional development to liaisons and liaisons are now required to participate in that professional development and then liaisons now to have a requirement to provide professional development. So state for liaisons and liaisons to school personnel to make sure that everybody involved in the lives of these children and youth understands McKinney-Vento definition and um, legal rights and responsibilities um, so they can receive the full protections of the legislation. With the next couple bullets here, there are some tweaks to current law. The second bullet here is looking at provisions for young children, making sure that they have access and receive educational services for which they're eligible, including Head Start and early intervention programs and other preschool programs that are administered by the school district. We'll have a little bit more on that later in the presentation. So that is um, some um, tweaks. And then the requirement for liaisons to ensure that homeless children and youth and families receive referrals, health care, dental, mental health, and then the, the, this ESSA amendment added substance abuse how, and housing to the other uh, referrals that homeless children and youth must receive. And again, this may is probably maybe something that's already happening, but now there's an explicit reference to it in the legislation. Now we'll look at the um, who's eligible for McKinney-Vento. So this is the education subtitle definition of homelessness, uh, which is referenced in uh, many other education statutes uh, in higher ed and early education um, in, in Freemio and the Child Nutrition Act, for example. So our, this definition is largely unchanged. 
Um, it is children who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. And then within that spells out the common situations, sharing the housing of others due to loss of housing, economic hardship, or a similar reason, which continues to be the largest uh, percentage or proportion of students who are identified as McKinney-Vento. Motels, hotels, trailer parks, camping grounds, due to lack of adequate alternative accommodations, that too uh, remains largely unchanged. And then we have other categories uh, that would fit within the umbrella of lacking fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence shelters, uh, living in places not meant for human habitation. And then this third bullet, we added a little bit from the guidance that we think is very helpful. Um, the, the part of the definition that is living in cars, parks, abandoned buildings, substandard housing, bus or train stations. Um, the department uh, did a good job, we think, in helping um, school districts and educators what it means by substandard housing housing. So if you look at the guidance, you'll see that they talk about um, not having fundamental, lacking fundamental utilities, um, infestations, mold, or dangerous living situations, um, encouraging educators to look at uh, housing ordinances. So that can be more helpful guidance from the department in terms of trying to figure out what, this, what sort of situation might qualify as substandard enough for McKinney Vento purposes. And then lastly, as we already mentioned, and we'll talk about a little bit later, the removal of awaiting foster care placement from McKinney-Vento. Um, for most states, uh, December 12th, I mean, sorry, December 10th and 2016, and for the rest, uh, 2017 for Nevada, Arkansas, and Delaware. And with that, oh, one more change to the definition. For unaccompanied homeless youth, uh, we, will, we often will say unaccompanied youth, and it's implied unaccompanied homeless youth. So um, the ESSA amendments clarify that the definition of an unaccompanied homeless youth is a child or youth who meets the McKinney-Vento definition and is not in the physical custody of a parent or guardian. So I think this, this falls more clearly in the category of a clarification. And then um, the rest of this slide here looks at some statistics and reasons why youth would be experiencing homelessness and not in the physical custody, custody of their parent or guardian, um, very largely the result of abuse and neglect where home is not uh, a safe place for them to be. So we know that many of these young people face additional challenges because they are going through homelessness and they are doing so without any um, caring adult in their life except for school. When we're determining eligibility under McKinney-Vento, these guidelines are the same. You're really looking case by case, getting as much information as you can with sensitivity and discretion, looking at that overall definition and the specific definition, the overall definition, and really um, taking some special note for some of the situations that are, are grayer in nature, particularly people who are staying with other people. Uh, where would you go if you couldn't stay here? Um, what led you to move into this situation can be some helpful ways to figure out who qualifies for the McKinney Mental Protections and Services. And again, NCHE has many wonderful resources. They are also in the process of essifying all of their documents and, and resources, and their determining eligibility brief uh, remains a gold standard in helping to, to figure the, um, how to actually implement the, and the McKinney Vento education definition of homelessness. So now I'm going to turn it over to Patricia to take on the middle section. Thanks, Barbara. Now that we've kind of covered the who of the McKinney Vento Act, we're going to look at the what, and we're going to focus on, as always, school stability, enrollment, and support for academic success. Now the school stability provisions uh, that have been amended by ESSA, again, as always, you'll see old language in blue and new language in a reddish color. A lot of the red language that you'll see on the upcoming slides is really information that's been in Department of Education guidance for over a decade and has just been moved into the statute. So for most of this section, you're probably going to say, well, we're doing all of that already, and that's great. Um, but there are some changes that we want to make sure you're aware of. So as always, uh, every LEA school district um, needs to look at each individual student's best interest to determine whether or not that student will remain in the school of origin. Uh, for the duration of homelessness and also with the ability to finish out the academic year uh, when the student does find permanent housing or enroll that student in any public school that house students living where the student is living would also be eligible to attend. 
Now, in making that best interest determination, um, of course, it's got to be an individualized decision, um, and it's going to be based on each individual student's needs. But we're also, uh, of course, needing to know what is the school of origin, and that's where we've got one of our important changes. Um, so two changes to the definition, definition of the school of origin. The first one on this slide, the school of origin is the school attended when permanently housed or the school in which last enrolled, including a preschool. Um, so there's been some questions over the years about whether preschools were included. They generally were not considered to be included, but now they are. Now, McKinney-Vento itself does not define the term preschool, and our Department of Education guidance doesn't either, but we do have a definition that is very helpful that comes from the data guide that the Department of Education puts out to help school districts and states know what data they should be collecting on what students for the purposes of the McKinney-Vento Act. And that data guide does contain a definition of preschool, and we've got it on this slide. Um, so you can see that it's looking, of course, at public schools. A preschool that is entirely private would not be covered by the McKinney-Vento Act, just like a regular school that's completely private is not covered by the McKinney-Vento Act. But if it's a publicly funded early childhood program for which the LEA is a financial or administrative agent. So you see it says a financial or administrative agent, not the financial or administrative agent. That means it could be one of many. There could be multiple funding sources. Um, there could be multiple organizations or agencies working together on the, on the preschool program. We see that a lot with Head Start programs that are split funded between the LEA and also the Head Start program, for example. Um, so it's going to include all of those programs that the LEA is uh, funding or administering or accountable for, um, including just LEA preschools, those that are funded by Title I, those that might be funded by similar state or federal funds, Head Start programs um, that are going through the LEA in one way or another, of course our preschool special education programs, and even home-based early childhood services if they again are funded or administered in whole or in part by the LEA. The other part of the definition of school of origin that has changed a little bit for us is that school of origin now includes the designated receiving school at the next grade level for feeder school patterns when the student completes the final grade level served by the school of origin. And I'm putting this change to the definition in the category of you know it if you have it. Some LEAs and school districts just don't have uh, designated receiving patterns. When a student finishes, let's say, um, you know, fifth grade in elementary school and they need to go somewhere else for sixth grade, all the children from fifth grade just kind of spread out and they go to different sixth grades depending on where they're living and there is not a feeder school pattern. There's not a designated receiving school for that elementary school. If there isn't a, feeding, a feeder school pattern, then th this piece of the law really doesn't apply. Um, so you need to look at your own community and your own school system and determine is there um, a designated receiving school, is there a feeder school pattern in place in our district or not. And if there is, um, then McKinney-Vento students, when they finish that last year in one school building, um, they absolutely have the right to continue with their peers up into that designated receiving school at the next level. Um, and whether or not they do that will be based on their best interest. And that gets us to the details of the best interest determination. The best interest determination, as always, is individualized. Um, and we always want to lean in favor of stability for students because we know the importance of stability for academic success, for high school graduation, and for uh, emotional success. Uh, so the law now says that LEAs must presume that keeping the child in the school of origin is in the student's best interest, unless that's against the wishes of the parent, guardian, or accompanied youth, and consider student-centered factors, as always has been the case. Um, you'll see that there are a few additional factors listed for preschoolers. Um, I think one of the most important ones is there might not be a preschool at all available in the new community that the child moves to. So the difference between staying in the school of origin and not might be the difference between having early childhood education and not. So that's clearly going to be an important factor in the best interest determination. Um, the other thing I would just focus on on this slide is if you notice at the bottom, uh, this LEA needs to give priority to the parents or guardians request. That doesn't mean always doing whatever the parent or guardian wants. It just means giving priority to that request. Um, and importantly, it also includes giving priority to the unaccompanied youth's request. And that is a pretty big change, I think, over what we had in the law before, where the McKinney-Vento Act said that schools needed to consider the wishes 
of another company needs. Now it says give priority to. Um, and I think this will be particularly helpful for uh, those of you who may have been stuck in a situation where a parent was saying one thing and another company youth was saying another thing and you may have felt a little bit stuck between those two um, but probably you know wanting to assist the unaccompanied youth since that's really what the McKinney Vento Act requires liaisons to do um, now it's clear that yes you are required to assist the unaccompanied youth and you are required to prioritize that youth's request not the parents if it's another company youth Um, we do have a little bit of new information on disputes. Uh, we don't want to belabor it because I think many of you have been doing this already, but of course uh, if the LEA determines that it's not in the student's best interest to attend the school of origin or the school requested, the LEA must provide a written explanation of why. Um, and that must be in a manner and form understandable to such parent, guardian, or unaccompanied youth. So obviously that would include things like language, if you can have um, some kind of template form in Spanish or if you have other languages in your community that are very prominent um, but also just using language that that a parent can understand you know we don't think that it's in the best interest to go to the school of origin because the commute is two hours long and the child has a disability that makes the commute dangerous that's you know simple language that anyone can understand and that must include also information about the right to appeal We all know that school stability doesn't really mean much if there's no transportation and there has been a change to the transportation requirement. So it's been in place for many years that transportation is required to the school of origin if it's in the best interest of a child to attend that school. Um, now it's clear in the law that that requirement applies also when students move into permanent housing and they are finishing out the academic year at their school of origin. So for students who are permanently housed, they also have the right to transportation for the remainder of the academic year. And also now there's a transportation to the preschool of origin. Since preschools are included within the definition of school of origin, then children who are attending their preschool of origin also would be entitled to transportation. Um, and as is true at the K-12 level for preschools as well, that um, is regardless of whatever transportation is typically required, uh, provided to other students. In addition, we have transportation uh, that needs to be comparable to what's provided to other students. So that's really not about the school of origin, but it's more about things like transportation to activities. Um, and then we also, of course, have to review barriers uh, to enrollment and identification that might be based on transportation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that barrier removal requirement in a bit. So when a child is not going to remain in the school of origin because it is not in his or her best interest to do so, that's when we get to enrollment in the local school or um, technically in any public school that students living in the same attendance area are eligible to attend. And as you know, this isn't new. That enrollment uh, for McKinney Vento students does need to be immediate. Even if the student does not have documents that are typically required like school records, um, immunization and other required health records, proof of residency, guardianship, etc. Um, we have some additional information now that if a student has missed an application or enrollment deadline during any period of homelessness, that enrollment deadline cannot prevent them from having immediate enrollment. So this mostly comes into play for some specialized academic programs. It might be for charter schools, it might be for magnet schools, um, perhaps a vocational program or a preschool program where there are lotteries or applications that happen in the spring for enrollment in the fall. Uh, when students experiencing homelessness miss those deadlines during a period of homelessness, they need to be, those deadlines need to be waived for them. Now we know that sometimes a student might come in in September and the district will say, well, we'll be happy to waive that deadline, that April deadline that you missed so we can get you uh, applying for the program, but it's already full. Um, we don't have a requirement in McKinney-Vento to force programs or schools to go over capacity. Um, but we will see on a later slide a requirement to anticipate and accommodate the mobility that students uh, experiencing homelessness uh, are living through. And so I do think we've got some force in the law now to do things like give students priority on the waiting list and perhaps even hold slots available for them in the anticipation of homeless students coming into the district um, in the summer or fall. So we'll talk about that in a second as well.
Enrollment, as always, includes attending classes and participating fully in school activities. Um, and here's that barrier removal piece that I want to talk about just for a minute. It's been in the law for quite some time that states and LEAs must revise their policies to remove barriers to enrollment and retention in school. We've now got some additions to that. So first, we have the addition of the word identification, barriers to identification. Um, I think this could be a lot of different things, and we'll probably start to figure it out at, over the first year of implementation. But just as an example, um, just last week I had a question from someone about a district that was requiring parents who were staying with other families to have that other family uh, write a notarized, almost like an affidavit, saying that, yes, this family is staying with us. Um, and I'm sure everyone on the call knows all the reasons why a host family might not want to do a letter like that and why that um, really is a barrier to enrollment. But I think it's also a barrier to identification because families aren't going to come forward if they know that they're then going to be asked to go back to their host family and provide that kind of documentation and information. So I think we can look at some of our practices and some of our paperwork and policies. Um, and even if they don't create a barrier to enrollment or retention, they might create a barrier to identification um, and taking a look at those and eliminating those uh, in our districts. In addition, we've got a little, uh, some new language at the end there, including eliminating barriers due to outstanding fees, fines, or absences. Um, so these things come into play, for example, um, you know, we're not going to let a student use the library because that student has some unpaid library fees or fines from a previous school. Well, since enrollment includes attending classes and participating fully in school activities and you've got a class going down to, to use the library, we can't let those unpaid fees or fines um, be a barrier to that student participating in the library. Um, similar with zero tolerance absence policies that say, you know, 10 absences and you're out for the semester or, or 10 absences and you can't earn any credit. Um, those certainly would be barriers to enrollment and retention that would need to be addressed. Um, and the Department of Ed really has put, you know, a lot of emphasis on this particular provision. You can see that red language at the bottom of the slide um, where they're really wanting states and uh, local schools and school districts to look at this carefully on an ongoing basis. Enrollment of unaccompanied youth, we really don't have a lot of new information here. It's pretty much the same as it's always been, except for the uh, issue that I talked about earlier about giving priority to the youth's wishes. Um, so I think we can probably skip over this slide pretty quickly. Young children and homelessness, we've talked a lot already about preschool. Um, and the inclusion of preschool in McKinney-Vento, that's perhaps the biggest or certainly one of the biggest changes that ESSA brought to McKinney-Vento. And there are some reasons for that. And you can see on our slide, um, the number of children under six that are experiencing homelessness is extremely high, I would say tragically high. So over half of all children in uh, HUD shelters are under the age of six. Um, the age at which a person is most likely to be in a shelter in the United States is infancy uh, under the age of one. Um, so we know that we have a lot of young children experiencing homelessness. Many of them are the children of young adults and youth who are experiencing homelessness. So there's overlap uh, between those two populations. In terms of what ESSA says about young children and homelessness in McKinney-Vento, well, we already talked about the inclusion of preschools in the school of origin. In addition to that, just two other quick things. State McKinney-Vento plans do need to describe procedures to ensure homeless children have access to public preschool programs. One thing that I would point out is that before ESSA, uh, this particular provision said that states had to describe procedures to ensure homeless children had equal access to public preschool programs. And you'll see the word equal is not on this slide. That's because it was deleted by the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, so what exactly that means, we don't really have any more information other than the fact that the word was there and now it's not. Um, but we have to assume that it means something. We assume that Congress doesn't just do things accidentally. And so what I would argue is that it means more than equal access. It means the state can do things that go beyond what the state would do for other children to help make sure that homeless children can access public preschool programs. Um, and you can see at the bottom of the slide the addition of early intervention services under Part C of IDEA. So really, you know, under ESSA, McKinney-Vento is really taking a second look at the state level, at the local level, at the LEA level, as well as community programs 
to make sure that young children experiencing homelessness really can access whatever early childhood programs are available in their communities. We already, uh, on a previous slide, put this uh, definition of preschool from the federal data collection, but we wanted to give you the whole uh, language so that you'll have this on your PowerPoint. You can take a look at it later, and you also there at the bottom have the link for you where you can download that and see that this is something that we got from an official publication and not something that we just kind of made up. So you can reference that uh, later as you're trying to kind of categorize your own preschool programs in your community. We also have some late breaking news, uh, which is that uh, there are some brand new Head Start regulations known as uh, performance uh, standards that were released just last week uh, on September 6th, actually just this week. I'm getting a little confused with my dates, just a couple of days ago. So um, even though the law itself was reauthorized back in 2007, much of the kind of meat of the law as it affected children experiencing homelessness was left for regulations. And those, it took a while, but those just came out a couple of days ago. Um, they have a lot to say about making sure that families and children experiencing homelessness can access Head Start programs. So we don't have time to go through all those right now, but we definitely encourage you to take a look at the summary. That's the very last link there at the bottom of the slide. And you can see the different um, provisions about categorical eligibility for homeless students, the ability of programs to reserve slots for children who are homeless. So um, there's a lot of good stuff in there that Head Start programs are going to be rolling out just the way we're rolling out ESSA. They're going to be rolling out their new performance standards over the coming uh, months and the coming years. So it'll be a process to get all that implemented and I'm sure Head Start programs will need some help and I'm sure that our schools are going to need some help figuring out their preschool requirements so it's a good time to do some outreach and uh, maybe have a meeting with your local Head Start program and figure out who's doing what and how and how you can help each other. I mentioned some changes in dispute resolution, and I won't spend a lot of time on these, but um, just a couple of things in red. You know, as always, if a dispute occurs, every state has their own dispute resolution procedures, and, and LEAs need to follow the procedures that their state has in place. There had been some confusion before about what is a McKinney-Vento dispute and what isn't. And basically, if it has to do with the McKinney-Vento Act, then it's a McKinney-Vento dispute. So if it's about eligibility, school selection, enrollment, of course, enrollment includes full participation, all of those issues would fall under the dispute process. Um, the most important thing, as always, to keep in mind is that if there is a dispute, uh, the student needs to be immediately enrolled in the school is with, in which enrollment is sought, and that needs to be continuous enrollment until the dispute is finally resolved at the very end of the process so that we make sure students aren't missing school due to the dispute process. Um, as I mentioned, there's written explanation of decisions and the parent, guardian, or an accompanied youth would be referred to the liaison who would help walk the, the student or the parent through the dispute process. Um, so that's really the basics of disputes and um, I know that we will um, I'm sure the National Center on Homeless Education will be updating some of their dispute templates and materials that they have on their website as well. So there'll be some more resources on this coming out. In terms of free school meals, nothing has changed on that. Uh, ESSA didn't change anything, and so far at least there hasn't been any substantive changes in policy from the USDA, so our Rikini Vento students will, will continue to be categorically eligible for free meals. Other support for academic success, full participation. Um, this is getting back to something that I referenced earlier regarding uh, enrollment deadlines and lotteries and coming into programs late. So we do know that states now under ESSA are required to have procedures to eliminate barriers to academic and extracurricular activities. Um, so extracurricular activities, of course, think about sports, think about your athletic associations. Um, if you've been trying to work with your state athletic association and perhaps running into some barriers or some blockades there, 
um, this language from ESSA together with the language at the bottom of the slide, uh, which is from the U.S. Department of Education guidance, which specifically talks about athletics, school sports, um, it might be worth taking that and trying to knock on that door again and say, look, we've got some new requirements coming out from the Department of Education. We really need to revisit barriers to sports, including varsity sports, for our students experiencing homelessness. Um, in addition to extracurricular activities, we're also looking at eliminating barriers to all kinds of academic programs like magnet schools, summer school, career tech, online learning, advanced placement, charter schools. And this gets into what I was talking about earlier. You can see that second bullet. The Department of Education is saying that LEA should anticipate and accommodate the needs of McKinney-Vento students to enter these programs, uh, recognizing that they're often full. So our students who come in in the middle of the school year or sometimes even at the beginning of the school year, it's already too late to get into many of those programs. So looking at giving students priority on wait lists, Looking at some of our data, if we know that year after year we've always got 10 McKinney-Vento students who really want to get into that online learning and they can't get in or they really want to get into that charter school and they can't, maybe we should look at reserving some slots for them in anticipation of, of their needs. And the last piece on academic success, and Barbara talked a little bit about some of this already, the credit accrual piece. Um, both at the state level and at the local level, we do have the need for procedures in place to make sure McKinney-Vento students can accumulate partial credits, hopefully put some of those partial credits to get together and end up with full credits. Um, and there are uh, some different suggestions about ways to do that that are in the, the uh, guidance on McKinney-Vento from the Department of Education. The other two issues that the Department of Education is really emphasizing is looking at discipline um, and making sure that whenever disciplinary action may be taken against students who are homeless, that there's really an analysis of what is causing that behavior, is it related to homelessness. Um, we know that McKinney-Vento does not overrule discipline policies, um, but at least accommodating some of the needs of homelessness and making sure that if discipline is really due to the homeless situation, that, th that those discipline policies are waived uh, because those are barriers and they're not fair. Um, and also recognizing that if we're talking about removing a child from a classroom or school, whether that's for a day or a few days, um, for McKinney-Vento students, a lot of different consequences come with that. They might not have a safe place to be during the day. They might not have any place to be during the day. They might not get a meal if they're not in school that day. So really taking a closer look at discipline and how that interacts with homelessness. Um, and the department's really emphasizing trauma-informed care as well making sure that all of our professionals who are working not just with McKinney-Vento students, but in particular with McKinney-Vento students, um, are aware of the effects of trauma on behavior and on academic achievement and some of the strategies to deal with that. Okay, now I'll take over for the next little piece here. Um, there are some very specific pieces in ESSA about helping youth who are homeless transition to higher education. So you can see that the, the ESSA reauthor reauthorization is truly full spectrum from early childhood through that transition to higher education. Um, one of the first pieces here, and this is brand new, the first time in the history of the McKinney-Vento Act to specifically uh, create mandates for counselors. So all McKinney-Vento youth must be able to receive individualized counseling from counselors to um, prepare and improve their readiness for college, including college selection, application, financial aid, and campus supports. Um, our Director of Higher Education Initiatives, um, Sakia Lee, is uh, very busy working on uh, materials and more guidance and uh, partnerships with school counselor associations, so you can expect to see more webinars and materials on this particular topic in the days and weeks to come. Another um, piece related to the transition to higher education is a new duty for school district liaisons. School district liaisons must now ensure that unaccompanied homeless youth are informed of their status uh, in FAFSA as independent students uh, for financial aid and that they obtain the verification of that status. 
um, under the Higher Education Act. If you are under 24, you basically need your parents' income information in order to complete the FAFSA, but there are certain groups of students for whom that's not possible, and the law uh, calls them independent students, either not possible or, or they're exempted from that requirement. And in the Higher edu Education Act, those are independent students. So uh, students who've been in foster care after age 13, um, pe people who have dependents um, in the military, and also unaccompanied homeless youth. If they are uh, verified as unaccompanied homeless youth in the year they're submitting the application, they too are independent students, but they may not know that. They may assume that because they are unaccompanied and homeless, they have no ability to go on to college. No one's setting that expectation for them. They don't understand that they won't need that information and that they can go. So it's very important, this, this amendment is very important to let students know about their status and to actually help them get that verification so that not only do they do the transition to, to higher education, but they make it all the way through high school as well. Um, related to that, we do have some um, new guidance from the Department of Education that is a departure from past guidance, which is that a school district liaison may continue to make determinations of a youth status as either unaccompanied and homeless or of self-supporting and at risk of being homeless as long as the liaison has access to the information necessary to make such a determination for a particular youth. So in the past, essentially liaisons were only authorized to make this determination for unaccompanied homeless youth while youth were in high school, which led to issues in the subsequent years of youth coming back to liaisons and saying, you know, I, I, I need a determination. And in, in the past, the liaison really has not been able, to, not been authorized to make that determination once the youth is out of high school. Um, now liaisons can do that as long as they have information, as long as they really still are in touch. We know that sometimes liaisons do stay in touch uh, for a number of different reasons. So if they have that information, they will now be authorized to make it. If they don't, however, if you, you know, you've not been in touch with a student or they became homeless after high school, for whatever the reason, if you don't have the information in your liaison, on to make the determination, um, then the financial aid administrator must make the determination. They can't um, send the student back to you and you have no knowledge of the student. They really need to be the ones making the determination themselves. So that is a, a, um, a new policy from the Department of Education that is specifically addressed in the ESSA guidance. Also, something else that's new, and this is not part of ESSA, but it's really important and we wanted to include it now, which is that there's a new date for the FAFSA. Uh, previously, it's always been January 1st, but there's a change this year. Starting this year, the uh, FAFSA will become available October 1st. So October 1st is a magic date in our world for a number of different reasons, not just because of ESSA, but also because that is when we will have the 2017-2018 FAFSA. And there are some a number of significant uh, benefits to this change in the date of the FAFSA. Um, it will allow students to complete it earlier in the year, which means that they will receive financial aid award letters earlier in the academic year. They can compare those award letters and choose the best fit college so they can see what kind of aid package they're getting from different schools and, and make a more informed decision earlier. They also have more time to submit that homeless status determination before the end of the school year. Uh, you know, January the FAFSA comes out, a lot of things are going on, um, and it, it, the clock starts ticking. So this really gives m more time for students, um, and especially for students who are homeless and unaccompanied, may need extra time in terms of getting everything in order for the FAFSA. So the big takeaway here and our plea is to please work to identify those returning and new homeless seniors as soon as possible so that there are not uh, delays in their financial aid. Um, you can see a resource uh, kit here, a link, and again, as I mentioned, um, our Director of Higher Education Initiatives, Sakili, has uh, more information on, on our website on the higher education page and she will be doing a number of trainings and webinars specifically on these changes in the weeks ahead. Moving on now to Title I, provisions within Title I uh, for ESSA. Again, the homeless amendments in Title I take effect for 2017-2018 school year. Um, some pieces, however, remain the same. So a student who meets that McKinney-Vento definition of homeless 
um, and is attending any school in the school district is automatically eligible for Title I services. That doesn't change. What will be new starting next year is that states will be required to disaggregate both achievement and graduation data for McKinney-Vento students. So this is something a number of states do already. Um, every state that currently is disaggregating their graduation data from McKinney-Vento students sees a lower graduation rate and a higher dropout rate for homeless students over and above the category of economic disadvantaged. So we know from those states that are already doing this that homelessness has a, uh, a devastating effect on um, academic outcomes over and above poverty. Now we will have a requirement for all states to um, provide this information and that means that we'll have a baseline uh, for looking in the future at improvements in graduation rates and achievement. So just looking ahead for that ESSA provision um, happening next year. More on the set aside within Title I, uh, the change for next year is that all school districts that receive Title I funds will be required to set aside funds to provide homeless children with services that are comparable to those provided in Title I schools. In essence, what that means is that um, even school districts that are entirely school-wide uh, will be required to set aside funds. Um, right now, the technical language of the law is school districts uh, uh, in reserving funds for homeless children in non-participating schools. So that is a change. Um, other changes in reg that you can see here too um, that are in the guidance uh, anticipating these changes coming ahead. So the Department of Education's guidance um, is saying that those set-aside amounts may be based on a needs assessment that reviews homeless student enrollment and trends over two to three years and multiplies by the average per pupil cost of Title I services. As you can see above, I mean, the law says such sums as may be necessary. Well, how do you know what's necessary if there hasn't actually been a needs assessment? So the law authorizes a needs assessment and the department gives some good ideas for how to do that to get to that right amount of set-aside funds. Um, they also recommend that the needs of McKinney-Vento students are reviewed at least um, more than once during the school year, knowing that things change and that the set-aside really should include an evaluation of the, um, the uh, past activities and how effective they were in accomplishing the goals. And this could include identification as well. So if you have a school district that is um, significant poverty but low numbers of identified homeless students, then it could be that the best use of that Title I set-aside is to maybe increase the time of the liaison or to do more professional development so that those numbers are more um, uh, more appropriate for a district with that kind of poverty level. Looking at the uses of funds for Title I Part A, uh, you'll see some things that are in blue and red, but I want to emphasize here that in this case, the red is actually already in a different law. So for this slide, there's really nothing new here, but it, it bears mention. Uh, again, the funds can be used for homeless children and youth attending any school in the school district, regardless of if it's school-wide or targeted assistance, non-participating. They can be used for services that are not ordinarily provided to other students, um, including to help fund the position of the McKinney-Vento liaison, even if that liaison has no Title I responsibilities, and to provide transportation to the school of origin. Now you'll see that those are all in the guidance there. Um, they are part of the uh, fiscal year 2016 appropriations bill that passed last year. So we have a situation where the appropriations bill made this law um, and then the Every Student Succeeds Act sort of put it in the law permanently. So new in the guidance, um, but not new in terms of how school districts are operating and this is definitely in effect for this school year. With respect to foster care, um, that is not our topic today, but we do get a lot of questions on it. So we just want to give you sort of the super, 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 super short version in three bullets. Um, we mentioned earlier that awaiting foster care placement comes out of McKinney-Vento uh, on December 10th and that new provisions in Title I um, that are very similar to the protections in McKinney-Vento go into place on that same date. 
So essentially educational stability and enrollment provisions that will be part of Title I. And the difference is this will be for all children in any stage of foster care. So it won't be dependent on whether or not a child meets the definition of awaiting foster care placement depending on how that is in your state. Um, in addition, with respect to transportation, school districts are not required to provide school abortion transportation if there are additional costs unless they're reimbursed by the Child Welfare Agency or they agree to provide it. What ESSA does is say that school districts needs, are required to work with child welfare agencies to develop procedures to ensure that transportation to the school of origin um, happens for children and youth in foster care. And then it very specifically says um, if there are additional costs, the LEA provides under these circumstances. One is if they're reimbursed, two is if they agree, three if both agencies agree to provide it. This also we know will be a challenging area um, because again it's it's a local procedure and we do have on our website as I mentioned a guide that we created um, in uh, with we co-published with the school superintendents association to help school districts look at what are those considerations they need to take into account as they're developing those local transportation procedures. And again, we already mentioned, so essentially what we have here is a, is a, is a separation of the populations, uh, recognizing that while there are very many similarities between children who are homeless and those who are in foster care, one of the biggest differences is the presence of an, another agency that has legal responsibility and funding for the care and well-being of children in foster care that is not true of children and youth who are homeless. So these new uh, protections within Title I acknowledge this, that there's dual responsibility and the unique role of child welfare and also that McKinney-Vento really needs to be able to focus on children and youth who don't have those additional resources or protections. So with that, we've got time for questions in the in the chat box. So we have uh, after this, we have a couple more um, resources to share with you in case you missed it over the summer. But we want to stop now, and I'll turn it over to Patricia, and uh, who is our our chat box uh, queen, <laughs> and you can wow. let us know what's come in. I just yeah, you just got promoted. Thank you. I feel, <laughs> you I feel very royal all of a sudden. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we do have some great questions that have come in through the chat box, so um, I'm just going to start with two of, that are related to foster care since that's the topic that we just left off and kind of move ourselves backwards from there. Um, so the first one, Barbara, for you is someone has seen some language around ESSA being used as uh, referring to doing things within one year of implementation, within one year of implementation. So the question is, in terms of um, the Title I provisions for foster students and specifically transportation for students in foster care. Does that start on December 10th or does that start one year from or within one year of December 10th? That, so with the within one year of enactment, it was specifically in ESSA uh, in the local transportation procedures that are required. ESSA was enacted on December 10th, 2015. So one year of enactment is December 10th, 2016. So those procedures need to be in place uh, December 10th, 2016. And that is true everywhere. That is not related to awaiting foster care placement. Those have to be in place to December 10th, 2016, because um, the bill was enacted, the law was enacted 20, December 10th, 2015. Okay, so that's an important clarification. It's a one year from enactment, not one year from implementation. Okay, Correct. Professor. One year from when the, it was actually signed by President Obama into law, which would be December 10th, 2016. Okay. Another question related to foster care, and I'm going to give this one a, a try and then let you help me out here, but um, it has to do with um, after awaiting foster care placement comes out of McKinney-Vento, so let's say it's December 11th, 2016, and we have um, in the school district some students who are placed in emergency shelters by the child welfare agency. So they are in the care and custody of the child welfare system and through that system they're being placed in the shelter. Do they fall under the Title I foster care provisions or do they fall under McKinney-Vento? Um, and I will say that this is a question that we've been getting a lot lately. We have had a lot of conversations, you know, with colleagues at the national level, and we seem to be reaching a consensus that we need to have an either-or situation, because that's really the whole point of taking away foster care out of McKinney-Vento and putting children in foster care under Title I, is so that there's a program that is um, addressing all children in foster care 
and that program is in Title I Part A, and we're having some separation between those children and the Kinivento. So we seem to be reaching a consensus that any children who are placed um, by the Child Welfare Agency, in the care and custody of the Child Welfare Agency, no matter where they're placed, that those children are in foster care and that they should be um, accommodated through the Title I Part A program. Um, and the reason that we're getting that is because we're looking at the definition of the phrase uh, foster care um, in regulations. There's a specific regulatory definition of what it means to be in foster care, and that definition actually specifically includes emergency shelters if children are placed there um, by the child welfare agencies. So we want to we want to run our consensus by the Department of Education just to see if, if our consensus is their consensus. So I would put that caveat on the information that I'm giving you. Um, but, but our interpretation really is we're going to go with that federal regulatory definition of foster care. Um, and so anybody placed anywhere by, by the Child Welfare Agency is going to fall under the Title I Part A protections. I don't know if you have anything to add on that, Barbara. And I'll put a link to that foster care definition in the chat box for folks, too. Nope, I have nothing more to add. I just think, you know, just like we have a definition of McKinney-Vento eligible students, we now have a definition of foster care, and it's it's clear. So I think um, I have, that's all I will say. All righty. Let me ask you a question about feeder schools. Um, the question is, what about a child who is in their last year in elementary school, and let's say in April of the year, that child moves into permanent housing? Um, does that child have the right to go to the designated feed, uh, receiving school for sixth grade? So they are in, it, it, they have the right to stay in the school they're going to until the end of that academic year, but the next year they would be permanently housed and so they would go to school as any other child would be in the area in which they're living. Unless I missed a nuance there. I concur. The queen concurs with your answer. <laughs> um, okay, another question is about preschool transportation. And, I, and I'll answer this because I think I was unclear, and I think this is why the question was asked. For any school of origin transportation, whether that school of origin is uh, ninth grade, third grade, or preschool, for any school of origin, transportation is required regardless of what the LEA provides trans uh, in terms of transportation to anyone else in, the in that school district. So if you don't provide preschool transportation for any other students, but you have a McKinney-Vento child who's going to be staying in the preschool of origin, transportation is required to the preschool of origin uh, for the McKinney-Vento child. And again, whether or not that child remains in the school of origin or preschool of origin is going to be based on best interest. So not all of your preschoolers necessarily will, will be remaining in the school of origin. But if they are, then transportation is required, and that is regardless of what transportation is or is not provided to other children. Um, another question about preschool transportation and this is kind of the combo of preschools and feeder schools. So what about a child who's in preschool in a particular school building and then they're going to be moving up to kindergarten? Um, do they have the right to remain in that same building for kindergarten? Um, do you want to start that one, Barbara? I'll let you start it because you, you no, asked it. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this one I think is really complicated, but I think what we have to look at is is the kindergarten the designated receiving school? Is there a feeder school pattern in your LEA from preschool up to kindergarten? And so it really depends on your LEA. I can't give you a yes or no on this. In some LEAs, you know, every child who's in preschool in McKinney Elementary School, they all go to kindergarten in McKinney Elementary School. It is a feeder school pattern that is a designated receiving school. If that's the case, then absolutely. Your McKinney-Vento preschool students, regardless of where they're living, would have the ability to continue in the school of origin in the kindergarten if that's in their best interest. Um, but from what we understand from different research we've been doing, a lot of LEAs have preschools that are, for example, completely open enrollment. You don't even have to reside in the LEA to be able to enroll your child in that preschool if there's space. Um, or it's completely independent of wherever uh, anyone's living. And then once the children finish preschool, they all disperse to c different kindergarten classrooms in the different areas where they're living, perhaps even in a different school district, perhaps even in a different state, depending on, on interstate boundaries and issues. So 
you need to look at is there a feeder school pattern? Is the kindergarten the designated receiving school? If the answers to those questions are yes, then yes, uh, your McKinney Vento preschooler has the right to continue in that kindergarten in the same building. How was that? Very good. Okay, you're going to have to do the next question. Uh, here is a good one, actually. We talked about um, waiving deadlines, missed application and enrollment deadlines during any period of homelessness. The question is, what if the student missed the enrollment lottery prior to becoming homeless? So, for example, the lottery deadline was April 30th, but the family becomes homeless during the summer and then wants to enroll their child in the charter school. What do we do then about, about enrollment barriers, about wait lists and priority, etc.? I, I am going to say that I think that the policy still applies because they're I mean, that, that, is a, that is a really good question because the law says in any period of homelessness, and so the question, me, you could say, well, they're their current period of homelessness, but if they, I think if they were, not, let, me re, let me think about that for half a second. I think if they were not homeless at the time of the application, then it probably would not apply. Um, it would apply for anything that happened starting when they became homeless moving forward. Do you concur, Queen? I do. I mean, I think we're, I think we want to make sure, generally speaking, that we're reading the word including, wherever it appears in the law, to just mean, in, mean including. It doesn't mean only that. So if we have something in the law now that says we need to um, eliminate barriers to enrollment, including, you know, those due to missing enrollment uh, deadlines during any period of homelessness. That doesn't mean that we can't address enrollment barriers that happen before a period of homelessness because the barrier is still caused by homelessness. So I think we have a different level maybe of mandate, but I think that we still have language in the act that we can work with, um, you know, potentially not as forcefully, but I think we can still work and say that's still a barrier to enrollment. You know, if there's space in that program, let's get them in. And if there's a wait list, certainly advocate for priority, uh, but perhaps not as forcefully as we could if it had happened during a period of homelessness. And, and I'm thinking, too, there's still the broad requirement about removing barriers to access that is not in the immediate enrollment section, but it just is a broader requirement about making sure that if students who are homeless are eligible for a program, that they don't face barriers to access. So I think that gives us a little something extra there, too. Agreed. I agree. And if it's a preschool program, I know that happens a lot, too, because preschool deadlines are in the spring. Um, we've even got state plan language saying we need to make sure um, homeless young children have access to preschool. So we could even look at the state and say, you know, we need to have some state level policies on that. Um, I think I have just a couple other questions that I'm going to bounce off of you, Barbara. There's two really related questions, I think, that are about, um, I guess, determining homelessness, I would say. And the two questions are, if there are questions, I think, or doubts maybe about residency or homelessness, what are some good strategies that LEAs can use um, to determine homelessness? So, so the specific questions are, are schools allowed to send officers to a house where a student says the student's living? You know, how do they go about doing that? And are, do you have any suggestions of what districts can do instead of an affidavit of residency? So maybe just some good practices for that determination. Sure. I mean, and, and here too, we do have, um, I'll refer actually the National Center on Homeless Education. Um, their link to their site is on our, I think, our very last slide. They actually have a couple briefs on this exact topic, which is how do you confirm or verify eligibility in a way that doesn't create a barrier for the family. So, you know, if you have a for example, a family staying with another family um, in public housing and you talk, you know, call the, the owner of the housing unit, you know, you've just potentially jeopardized the, the both families' housing. So that would be sort of a more clear example of what not to do. Um, I think, generally speaking, if there are doubts, um, serious doubts about a family's um, situation, it is uh, a good practice is to, to talk to the family about it and to give them the opportunity to provide evidence to the contrary. Um, this is something where a school district could put in writing, you know, we 
are questioning your eligibility because of X, Y, or Z. Um, for example, the bus driver saw your child get off at a stop that wasn't what it said, or we, you know, your your middle school child said X, um, you know, and we, we are questioning it based on that information. Um, you have the opportunity to to talk to us about that. And those sorts of open communications where the suspicions are not generalized, but they're really pretty specific, can be put in writing and then the family has the opportunity to bring forward um, information themselves um, to kind of address those concerns directly. Thanks, that's great. I did put a couple of those links in the chat box to some of those documents and I think, um, you know, it's important the, the word affidavit to me implies something that needs to be notarized um, and any time that something has to be notarized I think that's automatically a barrier that really has very little if any legal significance whatsoever so for me anything that needs to be notarized I feel like that should just kind of be off the table to, to send you know families or youth to try to find a notary and to pay a notary and really you know legally speaking it's kind of uh, a little bit of a throwback I think to a different age Barbara, I think we can go back to the PowerPoint now, and then if we have another minute at the end, we can uh, see about taking some more questions at the end. Sure. All right, so just to, this is a, falls in the category of in case you missed it, in June, in case you were out, uh, this is a amazing report, um, and really a groundbreaking report that was issued in June. Uh, it was done by Civic Enterprises and Heart Research Associates, but Grad Nation uh, put it out, America's Promise of uh, Grad Nation put it out. It is based on interviews and surveys with homeless youth as well as with homeless liaisons and state coordinators. So it really looks at um, McKinney-Vento through the eyes of the youth for whom it was intended and the people who are charged with implementing the law. Um, so a lot of really good information there good statistics and findings that really support these amendments to ESSA. So if you look at our website and you see our various ESSA trainings, you'll see we incorporated the findings because they really help people who are new to the issue understand why it is that the law mandates certain things. So just to put that on your, um, let you know about that and also let you know that as part of this report, there's a social media and awareness campaign, a lot of great infographics and um, that you can use, whether it's Hunger and Homeless Awareness Week in November or anything else. This is just an example of a finding from the report um, and one of the infographics that they have and the hashtag unseen students that they're using to get the online conversation going. So they, there's a digital media toolkit on their website that has uh, graphics like this. Um, here's another one, um, which basically findings from the youth, 78% um, of the students homeless more than once, almost half homeless with them, by themselves and with their family, uh, places that they stayed. So these can be um, just helpful um, tools to have as you go about professional development and educating your community and your school district and the service providers you work with. Also, we want to let you know, just to put in a plug for the national conference that is coming up at the end of October in Orlando this year. On our website, we actually have all of the concurrent sessions, descriptions, and presenter information. So if you want to see exactly what will be happening, what kind of sessions will be there on ESSA and everything else, that information is now available. Um, we've got, again, a lot of focus on places uh, where these pieces are already being implemented. Uh, the full spectrum, early childhood, K-12, higher education, more sessions on housing partnerships this year than ever before. So just to put that out um, for you to take a look at. And also just to let you know how to stay in touch. When we put new resources out, uh, we have a lot of different ways that we get it out. One, we have an e-newsletter that's monthly. You can sign up for that, which is a little bit more in depth. Um, also, we have another list, which is more about legislative alerts and webinars. So if you go on our website under sign up, you'll see there's two different lists. One's for a newsletter, one's for legislative alerts. And probably the fastest way to get information is the Facebook page. So for example, you know, we will archive and record this webinar and put it up and when it's up we'll let you know on Facebook. Um, the webinar that we did yesterday is already up online. So that's another great way to stay in touch with us. And then lastly here are the general resources. Again, our, our website, the National Center on Homeless uh, Education, we've been talking about a lot. National Network for Youth, which is our one of our sister partner organizations, particularly on unaccompanied youth, and some um, additional resources and DVDs. As we know, it's back to school time and that sometimes um, you know, a face and a voice 
uh, goes a lot further than a PowerPoint in terms of really getting to um, the heart of the issue and the, and the heart of this program. So you have that information there as well. Anything else, Patricia, in the chat box? Um, I don't think so. We're going to keep the chat box open for another minute or two so people can feel free to ask another question or two if you have them. But I think we've addressed most of them. Um, and of course, folks are welcome to email us at any time with additional questions. So I think we're okay to wrap up. Great. And we'll, we'll do with this what we did with the yesterday, which is that we'll, the chat box questions that we didn't answer live um, that Patricia answered, we'll put that transcript um, on the website along with the PowerPoint and the recording so you have that. So thanks everybody for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of your week and we'll see you on another webinar, hopefully at the conference. Bye everyone.